Okay, it's record now. Feel free to start whenever you want. Good morning, afternoon, uh, of whatever it is uh, where you are. So thank you very much for the invitation to give this mini course. It's only three days of lecture. I will try to show you some techniques that we use in mathematical control uh, problems. Um, so first, I'm going to start with some uh, examples in ordinary differential equations. And we are going to prove several results there. But uh, some of the techniques we are using are not the classical one in the case of ordinary differential equations because uh, I want to show you these techniques to use them later for partial differential equations. So first I will say that the, the problems in control uh, theory, I'm not saying anything because I, I have not said what is a control problem, but it is something that we we have every day uh, around us, okay? So when you light, when you open the light, on when when you travel and when you heat something or use an air conditioner, you are facing to some control problems, but or control devices, okay? But in general, some of these problems are uh, from engineering, okay? So you need to uh, uh, construct an, a device to uh, uh, manipulate and to obtain a, a result uh, using this device, okay? But uh, uh, even if at its origin, uh, control theory was mainly a control a problem from engineering facing more complex systems and more complex problems or technological problems mathematics are uh, on the base of them okay so for example a uh, lot of problems cannot be treated experimentally or even with simulations. Why? Because, uh, okay, experimentally, uh, you have this difficulty that you don't have in mathematics because it's, if in mathematics something goes to infinity, okay, it goes to infinity and that's all. But if you have that doing an experiment, that means that something is blowing up, you have an explosion, you have a, a big problem with, with that. And also you may say that we can do simulations, okay? That is not completely true because doing simulation is very, very expensive. And also you have another Control problem, in fact, is that uh, all the computers uh, heat a lot, produce heat, and then uh, you also have to control the heat produced by computers if you are using a lot of computers or a lot of time with the computers. So, it's much of the times, it's better to have a mathematical model of the problem and then try to obtain a result. So for the moment, I'm just talking, okay. Uh, in many cases, uh, you cannot uh, do, as I said before, experiments or simulations. And some of the, the problems are, for example, with climate, with oil recovery, with no nuclear technology, uh, with earthquakes. So 
tsunamis, things like that. Okay, you cannot experiment. And even doing simulation is very expensive and you can have other kinds of problems. But what is a control system? Because I, I'm talking about that, but I, I, I didn't say anything, okay? So mainly you can say that a control uh, model or system is you have a system, a biological system, a physical system, a medical system, or I don't know, an economic system, okay? You have some stimuli that for us are going to be the controls, okay? But there's something that enters in the system, okay? And then you have some answer uh, raw to this stimuli, okay? So if you have a population, uh, you can, uh, for example, one population or two, two kinds of predator uh, and uh, the predator, you can uh, introduce more predators, so uh, they they eat all the rabbits, for example. No, so you have a response from the system to that. Okay, you can heat or um, put some air conditioning in a room, so you have a response with the temperature there on the room. So you have different kind of uh, systems like that. So some of these systems can be described using, for example, differential equations. You can have ordinary, partial, or stochastic equations. And there we start thinking about a mathematical control theory. Okay, you have really a model of the situation you have in the reality. And then there, you want to act on the system to obtain a result, okay? So there we uh, uh, want our new is now what I say, a control, and we want to control the system. We want an objective, okay, to, to get to an objective. Okay, so in these mini cars, as I said before, I want to illustrate uh, the subject with some techniques in ODE and in PDE. Uh, in fact, in ODE, uh, I will present very basic results about that, and also in PDE, but uh, I see some experts there in the audience so maybe you're going to get bored about with that okay so i, I will start with od so i'm going to consider this kind of equation okay so it's an ordinary linear differential equation here i have a matrix a n times n and a matrix b also uh, but now is n times m um, x dot is the initial datum and the function x that is the solution to this linear system represents the state and u so we are acting by uh, the matrix B, so the control enters the system using this matrix B, okay? And my control is going to be U. If I don't put this term, the system is going to follow its trajectory thus as it has to, to do. So if I, if I have an initial datum X dot, I reach a state at capital uh, T, and you can use the variations of uh, 
formula to obtain the solution at time capital uh, small t. So you have these uh, uh, exponentials, matrix exponentials, okay? And you have uh, this other term where uh, B and the control appears, okay? So uh, we will say that system, oh, you don't see the part. Okay, I will draw it, okay? Uh, no, here it is. So we will say that the system is exactly controllable at time capital T if once you, I give you two states. So this is an initial state. I have here a final state, okay. I can uh, use a control U in such a way that the solutions, the solution when I use my control U here gets to X1 at time capital T. Here in black is the solution without control. So the system evolves naturally to some state. And here is the solution when I put this stimuli on the equation. So I want to reach X1. So X1 is a target, is a final state I want to reach starting from X dot, okay? So if you have any doubt, please stop me. Uh, it's difficult to, to teach um, uh, this uh, modality because I don't see your faces. So I don't know if you are learning or you understand or something like that. Okay, so we want to, uh, using the variation of constant formula, we want to obtain X1 equal to the solution at time capital T. So that's exact controllability, okay? I'm giving you one example. If my system is, uh, this is an electrical uh, system and I act in the first equation. So here N is equal to two, M is equal to one. So this is something I did not say. So in general, when uh, you have uh, your control U in RM, so what we want is M to be smaller than N. It can be N, okay, or, or, or bigger, but in general, we want M to be smaller than N. Why? Because sometimes you cannot control all the variables because the nature of the problem, okay? So when I was talking about um, some species in the nature, okay, maybe you can introduce rabbits to, to some population, but you cannot have more wolves because they are not. Okay, so you want uh, only to introduce rabbits. It's the only thing you can do. Or also using more controls is much more expensive. So in general, you want to use less controls than equations. So when I say that M is less than N, we have this matrix with A is a matrix of dimension n times n, okay? So you have n equations, and when you introduce this u that is in Rm, you have m controls, okay? So what you want to do is to use less, uh, let, let, let's say, uh, less equations the control acts in less equations 
not in all the equations. Sometimes you have to use all the equations, but sometimes not. So in my example, I only acting on the first equation. Okay, so here is the first equation and I can answer if it is possible to reach any state in R2 is starting from an initial data. So you can write down the solution and uh, you have this formula, okay? So you see that the, by the way I constructed, why I put my control, I only acting on the first component of the system, okay? So you can say that this system is not controllable, okay? Why? Because you cannot do anything on the second component, okay? If you want, for example, uh, the second component to be zero. You cannot do it because here we are going to have something that depends at time capital T is this uh, state, okay? You cannot get to zero unless the second component of the initial data is zero. So this system is not exactly controllable, okay? So uh, we want to see uh, what we can do uh, uh, to see if the system is uh, um, controllable. Sorry, here is a, a typo, is the linearity Uh, an invertibility of the system. Uh, so in this case, we can see that uh, instead of uh, any final state, we can uh, control to zero, okay? So this is not happening, for example, in PDEs in general. So this is, um, Mm, characteristic of ordinary differential equations, okay? So we are going to modify in this situation exact controllability to null controllability or uh, what is said, um, controllability to zero, okay? So let us assume that uh, our system is exactly controllable at time capital T. So that means that for any initial data, you can go to any X1 in Rn using this uh, control U, okay? So you have that X at time capital T is equal to X1. And I can, I want to see that uh, it's equivalent to null controllability or controllability to zero. So in one direction, so I can prove that if the system is exactly controllable, I can reach zero. Yes, because one, of the elections we have is that X1 is equal to zero. So if the system is exactly controllable, you can reach zero in particular. So now we have to prove the other way, okay? Let us assume that for every initial data, so this is important, means for everyone, you have a control, U, in such a way that you go to zero at time capital T. But you want to reach X1, not X1 equal to zero, okay? 
So you're going to consider the, uh, the system, original system. So here we have my matrix A that uh, is part of the original system, okay? And you put, you consider the system that has, let's say a final datum that is exactly X1, that is our goal, it's our final state, the one we want to reach from X dot to X1. So remember that here you have, you want the X dt equal AX plus BU, X of zero, equal to x dot, okay? So you want this system to get to x1, okay? So you can consider because the equation uh, is invertible, is well-defined from capital T to other time, yes? to get to each one, okay? Somebody has opened the micro. Please. <laughs> okay, so we want to, to reach this X1. So I consider this equation, okay? That is exactly the one with matrix A. So is this A? We don't have a control here. We just put the equation at with initial, initial or final data, x1, okay? So you can choose you a solution to this system because we are supposing we have a null controllability uh, problem, okay? So you can start with an initial datum that is our original minus z at zero, okay? The one I posed before. So this solution at zero, because it's well-defined, you have this exponential here uh, at time uh, t minus t small, capital T, and you can drive this solution because the system is not controllable. You can drive it exactly to zero, okay? This is our assumption that system is not controllable, okay? So if you put X of T equal to Y of T plus Z of T, what do you have? You have that at zero. So you have, uh, the initial data is x of zero is y of zero plus z of zero, and this is x of zero minus z of zero plus z of zero, so, so you don't have this part, okay? So the initial data is x dot, and at uh, capital T, you have X of T is Y of capital T, that is zero plus X one, that is Z, Z at capital T. So you have solved your problem, okay? So from this point, for ordinary differential equations, at least for linear uh, ordinary differential equations, we are going to talk when I talk about exact controllability. In fact, this is going to be null controllability. So controllability to zero, okay? So we have um, this important theorem that is a Kalman rank condition result. 
that is going to give us a test to see if uh, my system is uh, controllable or not, okay? Exactly controllable or not. So the, the, the result, the Kalman rank condition is the following. You have to consider a new matrix that is related with our system. So I remember that we want to control uh, this system. So you have AX plus BU, okay? So you have A and B in the system. So you have to construct a new matrix that is B. So you put as uh, column, several columns, matrix B, then matrix, you multiply matrix A by B, and then you continue, you have A squared by B until A to N minus one times B, okay? And you, uh, want to know the rank of this very large matrix. Okay, so if this matrix has rank N, that is the maximum rank this matrix can have, okay? So if you have this, then the system is controllable, controllable at time t, but in fact, you see that the rank of this matrix, at least in the case of uh, constant matrices, do not depend on t. So if it is controllable at time capital T, it is controllable at any time, okay? So we are going to prove this result. It's not very difficult. So we need to use Kyle's theorem, okay? So we are going to prove this result. So uh, we assume that our system is exactly controllable and that the rank of U is less than n, okay? We are going to see that we arrive to a contradiction, okay? So if the rank of u is less than n, we have a, a, a vector, a, a point in our n orthogonal to the matrix. So that means that we have a v that is not zero, that when mu multiplied by the matrix, we obtain the vector zero, okay? So we use this V, this is the transposed, okay? And you multiply uh, column by column. So what you have is that this V transpose times B is equal to zero, that V transpose times AB is equal to zero until A N minus one B. So all of them are um, equal to zero, okay? But you know that your system is exactly controllable at time and at any time, no? At time T positive. So uh, what uh, happens? So you have a control for every initial datum in such a way that not for each one, okay? So B depends, U depends on X dot, okay? But for every one, you can obtain a control in such a way that X of capital T is equal to zero. So that means that 
for each exot, we can construct this u that depends on exot, okay, in such a way that this expression is equal to zero, okay? But uh, what we have, we have, um, recall that we have that, okay? So we are assuming that the rank of u is less than n. So we have this vector in the orthogonal space to the matrix. So we have this equal to zero, okay? And uh, on the other hand, we have the exponential of 80 is uh, not singular, so it has an inverse. So we can multiply by this inverse and we get that minus x dot, the initial datum is equal to this integral of this exponential, okay? And now we uh, use uh, Kiley Hamilton theorem that says that if we have the characteristic polynomial of a matrix, then we, uh, if we insert the matrix in the characteristic polynomial of it, this is equal to zero. So we have that, okay? So what does that say? So that says that if we um, a, a, compute the characteristic polynomial of uh, A, you see that you have T to the power N plus lower order terms. Okay, so that means that a to the power n is equal to some uh, polynomial in a, in the matrix a of order n minus one. So we have a grade n minus one polynomial in a, okay? So, we use our V transpose, the one I had before, okay? We have this V that is orthogonal to all of, of these. And what do we obtain? We obtain that when I multiply this V transpose times A and B, we have zero because we had all these equalities to zero before. So in particular, we get that V transpose A and B is equal to zero, okay? And what we do is to write down the exponential or of minus to a equal to this series, okay, of powers of a, and you see that minus this uh, orthogonal um, uh, point to to each of the powers of a, k, b has to be equal to zero because of our equality. So I have this one, I have all the others before, and then from this I have all one, when I multiply by a, we get that this is equal to zero. All of them are equal to zero. So what I get is that this is not important which u I chose, okay? Because the orthogonality of vt to a, k, b is independent of u. So I know that the system is exactly controllable. So for any u or, or for any 
X dot, I can do that, okay, this argument. So I get that I obtain a point in Rn, that is V, that is orthogonal to every X dot. So that means that this point has to be zero because you don't have a, a point in Rn orthogonal to all Rn, but zero, okay? is the only one. So this is a contradiction. So the rank of the matrix, the, the, the big matrix I constructed has to be has to be n, okay? So we have one direction of uh, the proof. So to the other side, we again use uh, Kyle Hamilton theorem, okay? I think so. So uh, we assume that the rank of u is n and we want to prove that the system is exactly controllable, okay? So first I'm going to define a matrix M using the uh, exponentials uh, and uh, the matrix, the exponentials of the matrix A that is related with my system and the matrix B where the controls appear, okay? So what we want to do is to show that this matrix M is invertible, okay? And in, if this is the case, I have a, <coughs> an explicit uh, form for the control. So if this is the case, if M is invertible, I can construct U in which way I define it as this times M minus one times X dot. So for every X dot, I can construct a control U in such a way that uh, at time capital T, I reach zero. If this is the the case, you can see that x of t using the, uh, the, the, the formula for the solution, you, you see that uh, the, I, I obtain m here when putting this control u, and then this is exactly equal to zero. So our objective is to see that this matrix M is uh, invertible, okay? So how can we see it? So we take a point in our N and we uh, define this quadratic uh, uh, function, okay? This we multiply M by alpha and alpha transpose. And I define this C of tau that is exactly uh, alpha transpose, the exponential of minus A tau times B. And we see that is, this is, a, is something uh, non-negative. Okay, so uh, the matrix M is non-singular if and only if I obtain uh, a, a vector different from zero such that we get uh, this uh, equal to zero. Okay, so for every tall in zero t, we can say that uh, we, we can multiply c of tau, but this alpha 
transpose and we have this is equal to zero. Okay. And what we can do is to start uh, taking derivative of this exponential and evaluate it at to equal to zero. And at each point, we are going to obtain that alpha star b is equal to zero. And uh, we uh, repeat the procedure all the way long until we get alpha hat uh, times a n minus one b equal to zero. Oh, sorry, this is in Spanish. And oh, I don't know what I did, sorry. I'm not used to that. Mm -mm. Sorry, I don't know how to go back. Okay, here it is. Okay, so this means that alpha star u is equal to zero. And if we have that, so if uh, is no, is singular, sorry, this is non singular, is singular if there exists this alpha different from zero uh, that uh, gives this zero. So if we have this alpha, because our assumption that u has rank n, we are obtaining that alpha, alpha hat is orthogonal to u. But uh, this is in contradiction with the assumption that the rank of u is n. And then for we have that this alpha has to be zero and then m is inverted. So we have this Kalman rank condition. Okay. But in general, the problem with the Kalman rank condition that sometimes you can test if you have this uh, condition in a uh, ordinary differential equation situation. But if we want to extend this technique to the case of partial differential equations, you don't have matrix. So what means this uh, rank condition? You cannot generalize. So we are going to see a, a technique that in general is not studied in the case of ODE, but uh, in fact, if you look for a control book in engineering, you don't find this, the technique I'm going to show you now, uh, but I want to show we, you this because we are going to use it in the case of partial differential equations. Okay, so I'm going to denote using uh, this parenthesis, the inner product in Rn. So it's just the usual inner product. So if uh, x1, if x is x1, x2, da, 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 xn, so the inner product is given by x1 times y1 plus x2 times y2. The, uh, this one, okay? I'm going to denote that. I'm going to consider A start the adjoint matrix to A. So what is this matrix? So this A start is in fact the matrix that uh, does that. So if you do the inner product of AX with y, this is equal to the inner product of x, a adjoint to y. This is the definition. In fact, 
this is the uh, conjugated transpose of A. But I need to write it as the adjoint because this is going to be used when working with partial differential equations, okay? So I'm going to consider the adjoint systems. So recall, we want to control x dot equal to ax plus bu, x dot of zero equal to x dot, okay? So, I'm going to consider the adjoint system to this one. So here is no B. I only want to use A star phi. And this equation is backward in time. So I put the final datum, so at time capital T, OK? So what I am doing with that? We can see that an initial datum for my system x point equal to ax plus bu x of zero equal to x dot can be controlled to zero using a control u, if I only if I have this equality to zero, okay, for every final data of the adjoint system. So here you have b star phi. So what do you have is minus phi dot equal to a star of phi, phi of capital T equal to phi T, okay? So you can see that you, you drive the initial datum to zero if you have this equality to zero for every phi solution of the adjoint system. We are going to prove it. So you take phi uh, t and final datum for the adjoint system, and you consider phi the corresponding solution to this adjoint system. So you have minus phi point equal to a start of phi phi of capital T equal to phi T, okay? So if I multiply, if I take the inner product, okay, of uh, phi with x, recall that we have x point equal to ax plus b u. So you can multiply x point by phi, so I here I have x point phi equal to a x phi plus b u phi. Okay, so this is that, and I have also if now I multiply the equation, the adjoint equation, so the one satisfied by phi. I obtain that, okay? So what we get is that this derivative is equal to the inner product of BU with phi. And we integrate from zero to capital T and we obtain exactly this, okay? This is the definition of the adjoint. I only put it uh, together with phi. And here, if capital X at capital T is equal to zero, so we get the identity I had before, okay? 
So we can say that U takes an initial datum x dot to zero if and only if this is equal to this, okay? So we are going to see how to obtain this uh, kind of equality. So I want minus x dot time phi zero, okay, equal, here I have to the integral from zero to t of u b start of phi theta, okay? So that is uh, the my objective, okay? Well, uh, what I'm going to do is to obtain this condition by minimizing a quadratic functional, okay? So this quadratic functional, J, is defined on the solutions to the adjoint equation and uh, in fact to the initial datum of the adjoint equation, okay? Okay, so if we have a minimum, okay, we are going to see, so this I put it here by hand. So I want to obtain that, okay? I want to obtain this equality. So it's this one. This is the thing I want to obtain by minimizing this functional. Okay, so that's my objective. I want to minimize this uh, function. So uh, I have a new definition. I will say that my adjoint system is B star observable if for, I, I can, find a constant, a positive constant, such that for every initial datum in Rn, we have this inequality. So here we are, we have this B star that is related with B, my control. So I have x dot equal to ax plus b u. This is the one I want to control, okay. But for my adjoint equation, I have this b star here. And what I want to do is, so I have the datum of, at capital T, okay? So I want to observe my solution when I have evolved in time until reaching zero. So this is, um, this is a backward equation, okay? So, I am going from T to zero. So I want to observe my solution at zero from the integral from zero to T of B star of phi. So this is what we call an observability inequality. If I can do that, okay? Well, since we are in ODEs, so this is related with ODEs and 
not exactly with ODEs and the linearity of the equation, but that the fact that the equation is reversible, so we can go from zero to capital T and from T to zero, we have that the observability inequality is true if and only if, so please don't generalize this inequality or this equivalence to other equations. So this is possible to do it in the case of ODE, linear ODE, okay? So this is equivalent to observing the initial datum at uh, capital T, okay? Why? Because we have this reversibility, okay? So you, you only have to uh, multiply by this matrix. So you have this constant, the exponential of the matrix at cam, time capital T. So you can go from phi zero to phi of T. No, you have an isomorphisms between them. You have this exponential of A T minus T possibly. Okay, St A star, because we are in the adjoint situation. And you can go from phi at capital T to phi as at zero. So you can go from one to the other, okay? And you can see that the observability inequality is possible if and only if the observability of the initial data is possible, okay? So, in order to prove or disprove this uh, inequality, I'm going to recall you some results for uh, analysis or mathematical analysis in the case of a finite dimensional space, okay? So, of course, this inequality is not true all the time. I just show you an equation. So remember that I show you an equation that is not null controllable. So if we have, uh, uh, how do you say, if, if you have a relation between controllability with an observability inequality, okay, you know that uh, this inequality is not always true. I am not saying that this equality inequality is always true. So I want to understand this inequality uh, using another result, okay? So to do that, I am going to recall some results in functional analysis. So let's do it. Okay, so I will say that a set of, of vectors is linearly independent if I have a linear combination of them equal to zero implies that all the coefficients are equal to zero, okay? And uh, so I'm going to use a set, I, it's not important if I am in a finite dimensional situation or not, okay? But if I have a set of n linear independent vectors in a normal space, then I can show, and we are going to prove it, that there exists a positive constant such that for any choose of scalars alpha e of linear combination of these 
independent vectors, I can have that the norm of the linear combination is bounded from below by C times the, uh, the sum of the absolute value of the coefficients. So for people that know uh, more functional analysis, this is uh, in Rn, so what we are taking in Rn for my vector alpha one, alpha two, 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 alpha n, I am taking the uh, norm one. So I am adding only, so here I am putting the norm only of the absolute value of the coefficients and adding them, okay? So this is like, uh, this is alpha, okay? So I am putting some norm to the vector alpha, that is alpha one, that is al the sum of the absolute values of uh, the components, okay? So what I am saying is, if I, is I, if I have a set of n linear independent vectors in a normal space X, X may be finite of or infinite dimension, I can obtain this constant in such a way that the norm of the linear combination of the vector is bounded from below by C times the norm one of the coefficients, okay? So I'm going to show you that. Okay, I will put S equal to this. This is the norm one of the vector alpha. If S is equal to zero, okay, if the norm one of the vector alpha is zero, then the inequality is true. In fact, we have an equality, all the alphas are equal to one. So because we want to show that alpha one x one plus alpha n x n is larger or equal than c times alpha one, okay? So if this one is equal to zero, that means that all the coefficients are zero. So zero is equal to zero. This is true. In this situation, the inequality is true. Okay. Now, let us assume that S is not zero. Okay. So I will define beta. So new coefficients, new scholars, okay, beta j as alpha j divided by the norm one of alpha. Mm -hmm. So what we want to prove, okay, recall that we want to prove that alpha one x one plus alpha n x n is larger or equal than C plus the sum of alpha J, okay? So I am dividing by S. So in this side, we get one, okay? So here is this C. And here, because this is a norm, we are introducing 
uh, the S in each of the coefficients. And what do we, we have? We want to prove this inequality, but only for coefficients that sum one, okay? So we are in the sphere of radius one of Rn with the norm one, okay? So we are going to suppose that this inequality is false, okay? So we assume that one is not true. What does that mean? That contradicting this inequality means that you can construct a sequence, a sequence in fact of coefficients, okay, of linear combinations of my uh, uh, linear independent uh, vectors, my n linear independent vectors. So I can construct this sequence ym, okay, that uh, doesn't satisfy this um, inequality, okay? So what does that mean? That I can construct this ym that are less than one over m. So this is converging to zero and all the time, so my coefficients still have norm one equal to one, okay? From one side, since they are having norm equal to one, we have that each uh, uh, sequence of coefficients have norm less or equal than one for every j, okay? And therefore, by bolzano weierstrass theorem, so we are in R, we obtain that the sequence of the coefficients of x1, so we have this b1m, okay, has a convergent subsequence. So I take this convergent subsequence and denote it by m1, okay? So I have beta one M one that converge to some beta one. Okay. So I have to consider Y M one. What is Y M one? Y M one is I have beta one M one X one plus beta two M1, okay, uh, plus uh, y, x2, sorry, plus beta 3 M1 x3, two, 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 plus beta n M1 x n. So I have this y m1 is equal to, to that. And I have that beta one m1, this is a sequence, okay, converges to beta one. But again, the sequence of coefficients of this subsequence is uh, bounded in R. So we can extract a subsequence that converges to some beta two. And we can continue. So we have this uh, convergence subsequence 
and we get by a diagonal process. So now I, I have this beta one MN that converges, beta two MN that converges, and now I choose beta uh, a, a new subsequence. So I extract one subsequence from the other. So this is a diagonal process. And I can see that I can construct, this is finite because I have only uh, the coefficients from x1 to xn. I can uh, construct a sequence of coefficients that converge to bj. So each of the coefficients. And I have then a sequence ymn of uh, linear combinations with uh, all the coefficients that uh, have norm one equal to one. And then we have that ymn converge to y that is the limit of the coefficients. So this one is a linear combination of my uh, linear independent uh, family with the coefficients that are the limit of the original sequences, okay? And I have that the sum of these coefficients have to be equal to one. And then some of them have to be different from zero. If not, they don't sum one, okay? But y is equal to zero. I have chosen everything in such a way that ym, the original sequence converts to zero. Any subsequence of it, needs to converge to zero because I have that, okay? So I get that I have a sequence of coefficients that have norm exact one, but the limit is zero. But the x1 until xn are linear independent. So y have to be different from zero, okay? And uh, this is a contradiction. So we have this inequality, okay? Well, okay. So we're going to say that uh, two normal linear spaces, I is are isomorphic topologically if we have a surjective isomorphism phi that goes from one normed space to the other one. And we have two constants, m large m and small m, such that you can bound your isomorphisms norm two, okay, so we are going to V2, okay, by M times the norm of X in the space V1 and below by M small times the norm of X in the space V1. If we have that V1 is equal to V2, and we have that the isomorphisms is the identity, that is that phi of x is x, we say that x1 and x2 are equivalent norms, okay? So, infinite dimension spaces, we have that uh, this inequality, okay? We have a basis of the space. So we have 
a family of linear independent vectors, okay? So we know that for every X in my space, we have a unique um, scalars, okay? In such a way that X can be written as a linear combination of uh, these bases, of this linear independent uh, family, okay? And then we have an isomorphism from Rn to V, which is the isomorphism. So for each alpha, here is alpha is a vector, or so it's alpha one, until alpha n, okay, you can construct phi of alpha is this linear combination of the uh, elements of the basis, okay? We always have the triangle, triangle inequality because we have a norm and because of the norm, we can bound phi of alpha by, by m, large m times the sum of the um, absolute value of the coefficients. What is m? m is the, is the maximum of the norms of each element of the basis. They can be of norm one or not. I am not assuming they have norm one, okay? They can have any of them, okay? But we have our lemma, okay? So our lemma tells us that, I go back to our um, result, okay? It tells us that when you have a linear, a family of linear independent uh, vectors. Here, you don't use the fact that the space X is of, of uh, finite or infinite dimensions. You only use the fact that you have a set of linear independent vectors in any normal space, you obtain the C. Of course, the C depends on this linear independent set, okay? So you can bound from below the norm of the linear combination and the C is universal for any linear combination. So what we get is that in a finite dimensional space, so this is the C of the lemma, okay? So this small m is the C of the lemma. So what we get is that we have equivalent norms, okay? So in a finite dimension space, every norm that you can give are equivalent, okay? So this point is very important. So I want only to write down I don't have a, an empty transparency, but here, what I am saying is, for example, in Rn, I can give different norms to a vector, okay? You have the Euclidean norm, so X2 is what? Is the square root of X1 square plus Xn, square. You always have also x1, that is the one I defined now. It's x1 
plus xn. What I am saying, for example, is that here, these norms are equivalent. So this result implies that any norm in Rn are equivalent. So this one, these two are equivalent, but also they are equivalent with the maximum norm, that is the norm infinity, that is the maximum of the x i, no, i from one to n. So all the norms in Rn are equivalent. So this is important for our observability inequality. Okay, so I'll go back to my problem. So I wanted to prove or, or disprove or see when do we have the integral from zero t. So from b is start of phi of the d to square greater or equal than c the norm of phi to. Okay, so this is the observability inequality I want to prove, okay, or disprove. So I want to see if a system is null controllable. So this was related with this inequality in the case of ODE, I was telling you, okay. So uh, I will see that this observability inequality, so I put it DO, okay, is equivalent to another thing. What is this thing? Is a unique continuation result that says that I'm going to have this observability inequality, okay? If and only if B star of phi of t equal to zero for every t in zero t implies that the initial datum of math my adjoint equation, recall that phi was a solution of um, this equation, okay? Minus phi dot equal to a star of phi, phi at capital T equal to phi T, okay? So the observability inequality, this one, if and only if B star of phi equal to zero for every T in zero capital T implies that the initial datum is equal to zero. Why is that? Okay. You can see that of course, if B star of phi equal to zero, then we get phi of zero equal to zero or phi t equal to zero, okay? So for the, for the other implication, so now we need to see that the unique continuation property implies the observability inequality, okay? So we can define a semi-norm of an initial datum as B star of phi square, the integral to the one half. You can show that this is a semi-norm. Okay, 
So this is going to be a norm for phi t, okay? If and only if my unique continuation property holds true, because for a semi-norm to be a norm, we need to have that the norm equal to zero implies that the, the, the thing is equal to zero. Phi t is equal to zero, okay? But what we have, if we have the unique continuation true, I just show that in Rn, because we are in Rn, all the norms are equivalent. So if this semi-norm is a norm, we are going to have the observability inequality from the equival equivalence of norms, okay? So the observability inequality is equivalent to a unique continuation property. Okay, so it is important to, to notice that unique continuation and obso equivalent to observability inequality are not always equivalent. This happens in the uh, finite dimensional setting, okay? Don't, uh, we are going to see in the following days that uh, this kind uh, of property, unique continuation, um, so does not give uh, the, the observability inequality or the null controllability result. Remember that here we are trying to show that uh, that the observability inequality implies the null controllability. That is what I am going to show now, okay? But uh, these are part of my arguments, okay? So in the case of uh, the finite dimensional setting, that is in the case of uh, ordinary differential equations, we are going to have unique continuation equivalent to the observability inequality, equivalent to the null controllability, equivalent to the exact controllability. So this happens in the precise situation I am so showing you now. So in the case of linear, ordinary differential equations, okay? So, so we go back to our uh, functional. So I, I define a functional because I try to prove something equal to zero, okay? Uh, I recall you that we were, okay, let me, Go back. I recall you that uh, we were trying to minimize a quadratic functional that it was this. Yes. So if I have minus x dot inner product with phi of zero equal to zero t. Uh, the inner product in Rm of u with b star of phi, 
I have a no control to the original equation, okay? Because I have this equality always because of the construction of my adjoint system, okay? Because I construct my adjoint system in such a way that I have this identity. Okay, so I want to minimize a, a functional, okay? So this is the, the functional I want to minimize because I want to get something equal to zero. So remember that when we have a, 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 a minimum, I, I have that the derivative or all the directional derivatives are equal to zero at this critical point. If I have a critical point, I will have that the derivative is going to be equal to zero, okay? So if I have a minimizer of this, I am not saying that I always have a minimizer. I am saying that if I have a minimizer in Rn and I get the corresponding solution to my adjoint system, okay, I have this one, phi of t equal to phi t, then I have a null control to the equation and I have a way to estimate this control. So maybe I have other controls to zero, but one of them is of course given by the one that minimizes this function, okay? And why is that? Because I can compute the derivatives, okay? So I can construct, I can estimate this limit and this limit is going to be zero if I have a minimizer, a critical point of J, okay? So if I, I do this estimate, so I, I, I can put my, um, my estimates in, in the, in, I have J of phi T is equal to one half of uh, B star of phi square D tau plus X zero phi of zero, okay? This is the inner product in uh, Rn. Then you can estimate this limit and you get that this is equal to zero. But this was exactly, if I put here U, this is the characterization of a control U driving the solution to zero, okay? That was the first uh, things, one of the first things I did. So minimizing this functional is equivalent to obtaining a control to zero, okay? Okay, so I have that system is controllable 
not controllable, but I show that null controllability is equivalent to exact controllability in this situation, okay? So I will have null controllability if and only if the system is B star observable on the interval zero T. Why? Okay, here is the proof. So we need to prove that the observability inequality implies the exact controllability. Okay, so what in fact we need to prove is that the observability inequality implies the existence of a, a global minimum of by functional J. Okay, but J by construction is continuous and convex. So we only need to prove that is coercive to have a global minimum. So coercivity, what does that mean? That I say that always to my students that is like raising your hands, okay? So that means that when the norm of the initial datum goes to infinity, J of the initial dat datum is infinite, okay? And in fact, this coercivity is a consequence of the observability inequality because this implies that J of phi t is greater or equal that c times the norm of the initial datum square. Why? Because the observability inequality is this one, okay? Okay, this is my observability inequality. Then if we have that, okay, and phi of zero is this one, by uh, Schwartz inequality, we have that this term is what is, we have that x zero phi of zero is equal to x zero e to the a star t phi of t. And this is less or equal that the norm of x zero times e to the a star of t phi of t. And, okay, so here we have a constant. So we get that this is less or equal than the norm of x dot a constant tilde phi of t, okay? And you get that um, here j of phi t is great, greater or equal than c the norm of phi tai square minus uh, this c tilde x zero, the norm of phi tau, okay? So if I consider, I divide by the norm of phi, ta, phi, phi t, so I get that J of phi t under the norm, divided by the norm of phi t is equal to C phi, the norm of phi time minus C star x zero. C tilde x zero. So 
if I take the limit when the norm of phi t goes to infinity, this goes to infinity. This is constant. This not depends on the norm of phi t, okay? So this goes to infinity. So if we have the observability inequality, the J function is coercive, okay? On the other hand, we need to see that uh, that the system is uh, exactly controllable. And then this implies that the observability inequality holds true. But does assume the contrary, okay? So because we need to have an equivalence of, of both. So if uh, we assume that we have exact controllability, but the observability inequality is not true, then I'm going to have a sequence of initial datum of norm one. And since the observability inequality is not true, I'm going to construct a sequence in such a way that uh, this goes to zero, okay? Since the observability inequality is not true, I can construct something like this, no? Uh, oops, sorry. Wait. Like this. Okay. In fact, I can put this equal to one here. So this is going to zero. This part is going to zero. Okay. But uh, this sequence is bounded at our end, and we have that at least for a subsequence, this converge to some uh, initial datum. Okay. And then the solutions are going to converge. So the solution that starts at the say the 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 in the the limit of the initial data, okay, if, if I put that, this is the limit of the subsequence, okay? We have that all the solution, the sequence of solutions are going to converge, okay? And we are going to have that B star of the limit is the limit of B start of the solutions. Here we have continuity, everything can go. So B star of E is equal to zero. But we know that the system is not controllable for every initial data. So we can find an U that give us this equality. But this is true for every datum or for every solution of the adjoint system, okay? So as a consequence, I can put that on all the sequence I have here, okay? So I will have this equality for every, uh, putting here all the terms of the sequence and I go to the limit, okay? And I go to the limit and I don't have the result, <laughs> but at the limit, what we get, that we have a, a 
null control, okay? And we are uh, but that means in particular that uh, this is zero, okay? And what is happening? This is zero. The system is exactly controllable, okay? So I will have on the limit this phi of zero equal to zero t u b start of phi, okay? But uh, this is zero, that means that this is zero. And I will have this for phi of zero, okay? So what does that mean? That means that phi of zero is zero, okay? So this is an R, and then we have the observability inequality. So I finish today with that because tomorrow we are going to start with partial differentials equations. So please let me know if you have any doubt or uh, comments or something. I don't know if it is very clear. I don't see you, so 